we conclude the, um, the fourth chapter. So allow me to read to you at verse 14, reading to verse 16, and then what I'm going to do is I'll go back to verse 11 through 13 and touch on a few things to lead us into verse 14, and then we'll conclude at verse 16 today. But reading from verse 14, Hebrews chapter 4, the writer writes, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, last time we were together, we concluded chapter 4 by looking at verses 11 through 13. I want to use those verses to lead us into verse 14 and to, uh, once again, develop a, a context and an introduction. So in verses 11 through 13, the writer had urged his readers to enter into the rest that God had prepared for them. And he was making it very clear that there should be a singleness of heart and a singleness of mind in order to enter that rest. In other words, he was saying we must enter in. Notice verse 11 how he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. And so when he says let us be diligent, that word diligent speaks of exer exertion. That, that is something that we ought to have an urgent desire for. It is something that we should pursue single-mindedly. Now, Jesus exhorted his followers to that mentality all through his ministry. I think that those who think that being a Christian is an easy life only think so because they're not Christians. Because when you get saved, you begin to understand that there really is a discipline of spirituality that is involved in pursuit of the Lord. And entering into the kingdom of heaven isn't an automatic thing. It's not something that just happens to everybody who tries to be good. Entering into the kingdom of heaven is something that you do with a single-minded mentality. It's something that you pursue with exertion. It's something that you greatly desire. Not that you are going to be saved based on your works and efforts, but because you have that diligence and that desire, it demonstrates a true salvation has occurred. It's something that you per pursue with everything that you have. And, and Jesus made it very clear that it wasn't an easy road. Actually, it was a difficult one. Jesus spoke about being a gate in John chapter 10, verse 9. He said, I am the gate, and whoever enters through me will be saved. So there's that single-minded pursuit of Jesus Christ who is the gate, the entrance into the kingdom of God. Uh, in Acts, in chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible tells us, uh, salvation is found in no one else. There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And so when we uh, read the Bible and all and we see the claims of Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus was making some very strong, strong uh, declarations concerning himself and intended us to understand that and to pursue him. Because there is a demand involved in the pursuit of God, many choose an easier path, and they attempt to save themselves through their own efforts. I want you to remember that there are basically two religions on the face of the earth. You need to remember that. There are two basic religions on the face of the earth. Somebody immediately thinks, no, wait a minute, there are so many different ones. How can you say there are two? Well, there are basically two. There is God's and then there's the devil's. The devil's comes in a variety of packages, but God, well, his salvation comes through one person, and that's Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 25, there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That path seems to be appropriate. It seems to be the right way, but in the end, you end up, uh, you end up lost. You end up going in the wrong direction, even when that path seemed to be the right one. Jesus made it very clear that his path was a narrow one. Remember with me in Matthew chapter 7. If you'd like, you could turn there for a moment. Just keep your place here in Hebrews. Matthew chapter 7. And remember with me what Jesus taught us in verses 13 and 14 there in Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus spoke concerning a narrow path. He had said in Matthew 7, 13, 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because, he says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That word narrow is a Greek word that means restricted. 
When Jesus spoke of this narrow path, he was speaking about a path that was demanding. He was speaking about a path that was uh, calling for self-denial. That was the picture that he was using there. The way of the cross is demanding. It's torturous. It's, it's afflicted. It's, it's cramped. It's narrow. And entering into the kingdom of God is something that exacts a toll. In other words, sacrifice is necessary. That's why Jesus said, uh, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And so the picture of the pursuit of God is something that you, you release all the burdens, all the extra things, the baggage that would keep you from entering in. You release those things in order that you might pursue with full energy. And so Jesus made it very clear that there are few who find it. Now, when he says that there are few who find this this way that leads to life, and notice that he did say that there are few who find it, that would imply that this, this path needs to be sought for and sought for diligently. To find something speaks about looking for it, and there, there are a few who actually seek for it diligently. They don't pursue it. They don't look with all that they have within them. And so there are a few who find it because few see the value of seeking for it in the first place. That is, again, because people are normally seeking out an easier path one that is less demanding and requires less sacrifice. But the bottom line is those who fail to seek the narrow way are going to the way of destruction. When Jesus spoke of destruction, that speaks of ruin or loss and exclusion from salvation. And therefore, if you're going to enter into his rest, you enter in through Jesus Christ. Now, back in Hebrews chapter 4, that's basically what we're looking at here. We're looking at the fact that there are those who don't pursue. They don't enter in. And he was exhorting his, his readers here to be diligent. That's what he's meaning in chapter 4, verse 11, when he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Spiritual growth and spiritual uh, seeing the benefits of the pursuit of God is something that requires a lifetime of simple obedience and a pursuit of godliness. It, it requires that. And um, it, it's not really that difficult because I've discovered that you pursue the things that you want the most. You pursue them with all of your heart when you want them that much. That's the way it is. And if you want to enter into the kingdom of God and be a mature believer, well, you just pursue that with everything that you have within you. You do so because there's something to gain. You have an entrance into eternal life and the joy that God gives to you with that. That's something worthy of having. And it's not something, again, that you're working for. It's just something that you desire to have, so you pursue that. Uh, but the loss is eternal. And so what we look for is we look for, for the gain. We look for the entrance into the kingdom. We pursue that kingdom and Jesus himself with all that is within us, and we are diligent to enter that rest. And uh, that's what he said here in chapter 4, verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. And so he had been using the children of Israel as an example of those who failed to enter the rest. Remember with me chapter 3, verse 19. Remember here in Hebrews 3.19 how he said uh, they could not enter in because of unbelief. And so that's the example that he uses to believers. And he says you need to remember that the Israelites under Moses failed to enter into the promised land because they didn't believe. So even, even so, we do not trust in Jesus may be tempted to return to, and this is right into the Hebrews, could be tempted to return to uh, the Jewish religion. And if you are tempted to return to the Jewish religion, because he has Jewish readers here, then you need to understand you're in, da in danger of judgment. There's an interesting scripture in 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. It's a very picturesque scripture. Uh, Peter said, uh, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness then after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. He's saying you need to, to leave those things that you left behind, and you need to pursue by faith Jesus Christ that you might enter into his rest. And so as he was saying that, he began to speak concerning God's word. Remember verse 12 in chapter 4. How he said, the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, on the day of judgment, when all stand before the Lord, God's word is going to open up or lay bare every heart and will reveal its contents. It's, it's, we're going to be judged, in other words, based on, on God's word and, and how we responded to uh, what Jesus said. In John 12, 48, 
Jesus said, the one who rejects me and, and does not receive my words as one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in that day. And so how did I respond to God's word and, and the demands of Christ? Did I receive what he had or did I reject? And so it's God's word that is used in order to make that determination. In verse 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. All of this, obviously, is strong warning, and he's wanting to remind the people that there is a cost to rejecting Christ. It's interesting how he says in verse 13, there's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open. The word naked, when he speaks of that, speaks of being exposed, completely exposed, completely uncovered. The word open is an interesting picture, and there, it's actually used in three different ways in the Greek language. But it's a picture of somebody whose neck is being bent back. It, it could be used in a picture of a, a sacrifice. It, it can be used in a picture of a, a battle where a soldier has gotten the better of somebody and has bent their back completely, their neck completely back from the hair like that, and they have a knife to their throat, and that's the picture that you have right here. It could be a picture of, of wrestling uh, where somebody has gotten hold of his opponent and has used a move to be able to expose the throat. But it's all a picture of, of exposure and it's a picture of helplessness. It's a picture of the fact that, uh, that, uh, that God is in control of all things and, and we human beings, rather than having some kind of mentality of being able to succeed in our efforts to, uh, to um, overwhelm him, we are the ones who actually are, are overwhelmed and conquered by God. And so that's the picture that he wants us to see. There's no creature hidden from his sight. He sees everything. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So God sees everything. Psalm 33, verses 13 and 14 says, The Lord looks from heaven. He beholds all the sons of men. From the place of his habitation, he looks upon the inhabitants of the earth. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Psalm 90, verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. Everything is open and exposed. Not a single thing is hidden. He sees it all. And um, that's just another picture of our, of our being exposed before the Lord and God knowing everything, no matter what it is that we do, God knowing it all. And, and I've said this to you in a variety of ways over the years, how how sometimes we think that we can um, hide from the Lord. Sometimes we could, can um, keep him from seeing some things, but, but that obviously never happens. And I like to share with you the things that my grandson does, and, and I shared with you recently how he'll hide under a blanket, but his feet will be exposed, and, and he thinks that you can't see him because he'll say, let's hide, and, but his feet are exposed, and you see these big old feet hiding under the blanket. He did that just the other day. It's something different, though. He came, uh, my daughter, Anna, was coming into the room, and he said, here comes Anna. And he said, let's hide, and so he just, he puts his head behind my back. His whole body is exposed, but his little head is behind my back, and he thinks she can't see him because he can't see her. And so I take him, I put him on my lap, and I put my hand over his eyes like this, and I'll say, she can't see you, can't she? No. Can you see her? No. And I'll just do that. The whole body's there, but, and I'll say, and, and Anna will walk in and say, where'd he go? And I'll say, I've got no idea. He's hiding from you. You're going to have to find him. And he's sitting on my lap, you know, like this. And, and, and it's so easy to see him. But the funny thing about Josiah is he actually does think that he's hiding. And the funny thing is, is I do that before the Lord too. I try to hide from him. I try to keep from being exposed. And the fact is, of course, and even as I shared recently, we are open to him. He does see. There's not a thing that is hidden. And so that's what we were looking at last time we were together. And now we can move on into verse 14. And he continues by saying in verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Seeing that Jesus is our true high priest, let us hold fast to him. This is the third time in, in, in this book that he refers to Jesus as a high priest. We'll look at that in just a moment. But he mentioned uh, Jesus as a high priest in chapter 2, verse 17, when he said he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. He also said something of him being the high priest in chapter 3, verse 1, when he said, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So this is the third time that he refers to Jesus Christ as being our great high priest. 
And so altogether in the book of Hebrews, he speaks of the office of the high priest uh, in 16 passages. In the Old Testament, God established the office of what is called the high priest. There are certain qualifications for the high priest, and, and we'll be seeing them as we go through uh, the book of Hebrews, because he does mention uh, many of these, uh, these uh, qualifications. But, but he's a person, according to chapter 5, verse 1, who offers gifts and sacrifices to God. Uh, uh, a second thing about him is he was called by God and not by man. You see that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 4. Uh, he alone is the one who offers the highest sacrifice under the law of Moses, which is uh, on the Day of Atonement. You see that in Leviticus chapter 16. According to Hebrews 7.25, he is the one who mediates between God and man. And according to Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 and 20 through 27, he's the one who blesses the people of God. This was an individual who would stand before the people and stand representing God, and he would stand before God representing the people. He was the high priest. And so Jesus Christ is referred to in that way. And I want you to see what he says in verse 14. He says, let us hold fast our confession... Now, when he says, let us hold fast our confession there, that's another way of him saying to us that you need to remain committed to Christ. Seeing that Jesus is the true high priest, hold fast to him. Now, it's interesting because he is emphasizing the responsibility of a believer. And I find this interesting because as I read the Bible, I see that there are things that God says that, that he does, and there are things that he says I'm supposed to do, and, and I have certain responsibilities that God has called me to, and, and then there are things that God himself does on my behalf. Now, let me show you this in Scripture. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. I want to develop something with you very briefly here. Philippians chapter 2, and I'll show you verses 12 and 13. Just to emphasize that, there is a part that you play, and there's a part that, that God plays, and we work this together. God's uh, part, obviously, is the key and the cardinal part, but we do have a responsibility. I want to show you this. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. Notice this. You'll see man's part and God's part. In verse 12, Philippians 2, Paul said, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence... Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You've always obeyed when I'm around, but now that I'm absent, that's the true test of your character. It's one thing when you're the boss and you leave orders to the employees and you say, I need you to do these things and have them done by such and so time. And they say, yes, sir, and as long as you're there, they're doing the work that they've been uh, commanded to do. But when you walk out of that room and they say, is he gone yet? And the answer is, yeah, he just drove away. Okay, and then you just begin to do whatever it is that you want to do because you figure you've got a half hour or 40 minutes to goof off. It's one thing to obey when somebody is standing there saying, do this. It's another thing when you have the maturity and responsibility to understand that you've got a role to play and therefore you do that regardless of anybody's watching you or not. Well, in salvation, he says that. He says, you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, and therefore work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, notice with me, he didn't say work for your own salvation. He said work out your salvation. Salvation is something you've already entered into and therefore live a life demonstrating that you've been saved. But I have a responsibility, and that is to work out my own salvation. And how do I do it? Well, I do it with fear and trembling. But notice verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God who works in you both to want to and to ultimately be pleasurable to him. It's God who does that work in you. In other words, my part is to simply obey. His part is giving me the will to do that. He puts that within me. I'm, I'm fascinated by the Pharisees in the New Testament. The Pharisees, and you, we've all read of the Pharisees. You're found, they, they're found in the, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. They're mentioned um, often. Jesus had um, these incredible opponents called the Pharisees. The Pharisees' history is kind of muddled. It's very difficult to discover exactly where they came from and how this movement began. But it more than likely began somewhere about 200, 150 years before Christ. The Greeks had entered into Israel, and as the Greeks were conquering, 
they began what is called the Hellenization of Israel. What that simply means is they began to impose their culture on the nation of Israel. Now, the nation of Israel recognized itself as being a nation that was set apart by God to shine as lights in a very dark world. When the Hellenizers came in and began to replace the Hebrew language with, with Greek and began to bring in their, uh, their athletic games and be began to bring in their, their uh, philosophies and, and they started to impose on them a, a variety of their cultural things, uh, the people began to uh, absorb that. Some began to, to actually hold fast to some of the Greek thought. And even the religious individuals began to do so. And a, a sect of Judaism arose called the Sadducees. The Sadducees began to uh, assimilate some of the uh, Greek thought and all, and therefore began to deny things like the resurrection spirits and angels and things like that. What, they had hap what happened is they became the upper elite, the, the liberals of the society, the philosophers, and they began to embrace the Hellenization process. Well, there was another group of people who were very conservative. And when they saw this taking place, they said, we don't want any part of this. So they began to strain at the law. They began to look at the law more closely and began to really hold fast to the things that they recognized and wanted to be separated from the Hellenization process, and therefore, they were called Pharisees. The, the word Pharisee means the separated one. And so they were separating from the Greek process of bringing the worldliness into the nation, and at first, they were responding to that with a love for God and His Word. Ultimately, though, what happened is they began to take the commands of men and they began to make them equal to the commands of God. And in doing so, they began to undermine God's word and replace them with man's process. When that happened, they became what we now call the Pharisee. They became legalistic. Jesus would speak to them very often and say things to them like, you're like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but inside you're filled with decay. He'd look at them and say, you guys are hypocrites. You, st you strain at gnats and you swallow camels. And he would, he would lay it on thick with them constantly because they would forbid people from entering into the kingdom of heaven by opposing Jesus Christ through their rules and their regulations. Initially, the Pharisees wanted to do something that was right, but ultimately what they did is they replaced the word of God with man-made regulations. And that's why Jesus Christ would speak to him in the harsh way that he did. And that's why we would see in the New Testament how God makes promises to us. One of those promises uh, are that he is, is that he will place his, his law upon our hearts. And so it's not just the outward observation. It's not just the doing of the third, certain things. It's the being of a certain person. God wants to transform us from within. And what he does is he takes his word and imparts it to you. And he does it from inside. There are reasons that you don't steal, not just because you might get caught. That's one of the lower reasons. If I get caught, you know, therefore I don't steal. You know, we teach our children don't steal because you get in trouble. But if you live with that mentality all of your life, you really don't develop morally because the only thing that gives you permission to do something or not do something is going to be the law. Therefore, if the law permits something, even if it's immoral, you'll feel that it's okay to do it because the law permits that. And that's what we see, by the way, in the American society today. If it's legal, then it's okay. And that's why you see that kind of mentality, because they don't rise beyond that. Christians have a higher law. We have a law of conscience. And that's why when the Lord gets hold of your heart, it takes the word of the Lord to direct you. That's why famous stories like uh, Sergeant Alvin York come to mind, where where he had become a Christian, and as a Christian, he reads the Bible. He reads the Bible. It says, thou shalt not kill. He's drafted to go into the military, but he refuses to go in. The reason he doesn't go in is based on the fact that God said, I'm not to kill. And so he goes in and determines that he can go in because Jesus teaches him also in the Word of God that you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. And what he does is he comes to realize that there are certain obligations that we have to the government because we're living under that authority that gives us permission to do certain things. But he went to the law of conscience and the word of God to make a determination to do what was right. And so it, that's how it works for us. When God takes his law and places it on my heart, I'm not committing adultery because I love him. His word is within me. I love my wife but it's not something I desire to do. It's because God is working in me both to will and to do. It's God's word within me because I have received his word and it is written on the tablet of my heart 
that keeps me from doing the things that my flesh desires. Very basic Christian teaching, but it's a place where a lot of people make their mistakes. Because what happens is we start to say, well, if I don't do these things, then I'm better because, than the average person because I don't do them and they do. And that's Pharisee, Phariseeism. That's legalism. That's not a righteous way to think. I don't do these things because it's God who gives me the will or the desire not to do them and the desire to please him. So one, I work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. But two, for it is God who works in me both to will and to do. God not only changes my will, but he also gives me the ability to perform that which he's changing my will to conform to. So whereas at one point I thought it would be all right to do a certain thing, when I get the word of God in me, I fall in love with Jesus Christ, I yield myself to him, then I realize that one, I have a responsibility, I do a certain thing, but two, he gives me the power to be obedient to him, to bring pleasure to him. So turning on back to Hebrews, Jesus Christ has come in order that he might give to us the ability to have relationship with God. And what Jesus Christ is, is he is our priest. He's the one who represents me to God and represents God to me. In the Old Testament, you had the high priest who was selected by, uh, amongst men by God who had these qualifications to offer the gifts and sacrifices and, and mediate between God and man and all of that and bring blessings to the people. And that's what he's saying Jesus is. And so he speaks concerning him here in verse 14, and he says again, "'Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens,' Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us remain true to him. Let us remain committed to him. Let us hold firmly to him. Now notice he says in verse 15, uh, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. His divinity didn't prevent him from experiencing our feelings, our sorrows, our emotions, and our pains. The Son of God came to seek us where we are in order that he might bring us to be with him where he is. You know, when I was a new Christian, new Christian meaning within the first few years of my walk with Christ, I can remember on numerous occasions, and by the way, I still do this on occasion, but I did it frequently when I was first saved, when I was learning how to pray and learning how to trust in the Lord I can, I, can remember, I can remember almost verbatim uh, a prayer because I prayed this prayer quite often in a variety of ways, but I did pray this prayer quite often. And basically, it was simply this, God, you understand. God, you understand. You know exactly what I am feeling right now, Jesus. I know you do. I have no doubt in my mind. You understand. And I think one of the things that is very most important to me was to have somebody who understood me. I don't know about you, but for me, that was very important. I wanted somebody who understood me. You know, and um, going through girlfriend after girlfriend, I was so crazy they never did understand me. Ultimately, I realized that that's because I didn't understand myself either. I can still remember getting arrested on one occasion and being taken to Los Angeles, uh, to the jail there in L.A., and um, calling up a friend of mine. I called his father up because I didn't want to call my dad, so I called a friend of mine's father, and I said, can you come and bail me out and get me out of here? I was 18 years old. I was driving a Volkswagen, 1965 Volkswagen. It was my dad's car. They had let me drive. And uh, I'd been drinking pretty much all night. And um, I was speeding, and, and I actually pulled the, uh, the gear shifter out of the transmission. You know, I was just so drunk, I slammed a gear and just pulled it right out of the transmission. And so the car wouldn't move. I was in fourth gear, and it wouldn't go, you know, once I had to stop. And so I couldn't get rolling. And I was so drunk, I, I, I couldn't even feather it so that I could get the thing rolling. And some guys pulled up behind me in a, in a big old uh, Pontiac Grand Prix. I still remember it. Enormous car, giant car. And they were loaded on reds. And I was on Pioneer Boulevard in Norwalk. I still remember some of this. And they pulled up behind me. They said, can we help you? And I said, sure, would you please? And they said, yeah, what do you need? I said, can you get me rolling? And they said, okay. And so they got their Grand Prix behind this Volkswagen of mine and, and started pushing me, but they were so loaded they never stopped. And so we were going down Pioneer Boulevard going towards Imperial Highway, and um, at the last minute they stop, and they slingshot me into the intersection going about 45 miles an hour. 
And so I went flying into the intersection, hitting the brakes and trying to make the turn, which I didn't make, so I hit a, I hit a signal that was there in the island and smashed the car and then kind of like rolled over to the side of the road. And, I, and I'm just standing there totally like, wow, what happened just now? And, and then a car pulls over. It's a, a girlfriend of mine. She says, David, what are you doing? I says, I'm going home. She says, it doesn't appear that you are. <laughs> um, and a police officer, a sheriff from the Norwalk substation pulled up behind me and he said, you stay in the car. Uh, if you get out, I'm going to have to arrest you for being drunk in public, which didn't make sense to me even to this day. I was so drunk, I'm behind the wheel. But if I climb out, you know, I'm going to get arrested. So if I, as long as I stay in this shell, I'm okay. But anyway, he said, stay there. And, and, but this girl was there and I wanted to look real cool. So I climbed out of the car and before you know it, I've got these cuffs on. They're taking me to the Norwalk substation. And I still remember being booked and, and I was a punk. You know, I had the long hair and one of the officers was speaking to me and said to me, what are you, a girl or are you a boy? Because when at that time, if you had long hair, they'd make fun of you. So he says, what are you, a girl or a boy? And I looked at him and I said, at your age, if you have trouble distinguishing between male and female, you're in trouble. And uh, he didn't appreciate that. So he said, um, take off your glasses, and then he sprayed me with mace. I do remember that very well. Very painful experience, and you learn some lessons through those things. And they threw me in the drunk tank there. And a few minutes later, or maybe an hour or so later, here comes these three guys <laughs> that had given me a ride. They got arrested for... Uh, um, for um, being loaded and, and all. And the next morning I wake up and there they are and they still had reds on them so we dropped some reds and off we went to jail. I still remember that very well. Well, not very well, cloudedly, but I do remember it. Going to jail and then now I'm being processed into uh, the L.A. jail and I call up my friend's dad, Ed, Ed Solly. I said, Ed, can you come and get me? And he said, uh, where are you? I said, I'm in Los Angeles. So what are you doing there? Well, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm arrested. I've been arrested. And so he calls my dad, and my dad comes to pick me up. I'll never forget that wonderful conversation with my dad. He was pretty upset. My dad didn't smoke, but he had a pack of cigarettes, and he went through half of that pack, taking me from, uh, from L.A. to Norwalk. I mean, he just was chain-smoking one after another. He was so upset, sent me to a psychiatrist to try and get me figured out, which it didn't work. Um, all of that to be saying this, you know, it, it, it takes the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, a transformed life that comes through conversion to actually answer those questions for you. Uh, it, it, it comes through a relationship with God. It, it, it comes through the knowledge that there's somebody out there who understands you. And, and, and so I was going through girlfriends, and I wanted them to understand me, but they did not understand me. And I would try and tell them, this is how I feel. This is what I want. These are the desires of my heart. And, you know, at the age of 18, 19, 20, what girl wants to be shackled with those kinds of emotional problems? And, and so I got dumped right and left. I never really understood why. It's because they didn't want to sign up to be Dr. Phil to me. You know, they, they didn't want to be my therapist. They wanted a normal relationship with somebody who'd like to go to the zoo once in a while rather than be a monkey, you know, and, and that's the way it worked, you know. And so when I finally met the Lord, that's where I began to understand that there is one person who understands. You know, my precious Marie, whom I've been with for many years now, to this day doesn't understand me. And you know what? That's okay, because I've never understood her either. <laughs> and we get along just fine with the things that we do understand. But there is one person who does understand me, and that's what I see here in verse 15, Jesus Christ. He is the one who, who does sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands. Why? Because he was in all points tempted as we are, yet he did not give in to sin. Jesus understands. He understands weakness. When he understands weakness, is another way of saying he understands the limitations of humanity. Jesus understands. That's why, that's why the Bible will present him there at the tomb of Lazarus and how that they had come, messengers had come and said to Jesus, uh, the one whom you love, Lazarus, he, he's sick unto the point of death. And that's why Jesus, though he delayed for a while, ultimately ends up going, asks, where is he? They take him to the tomb, and as he sees the people around him weeping for the loss of this man that was so beloved by them, 
That's why the Bible gives us the shortest New Testament verse where it simply says Jesus wept. And he was there weeping, weeping at what sin does to humanity, weeping at the loss these people are feeling. He understands loss. He's the one that when, when uh, people would approach him and, and would say, uh, Lord, could you pray for my, for my children? He, he was the one that when they would bring the babies to him, that he would actually take them in his arms and hold him, hold the babies and, 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 and bless them. He understood these kinds of things, and, and he loved the babies and all, and that always has spoken to my heart to see the way he was. Jesus is the one who suffered hunger. The, he, he suffered thirst. He suffered fatigue. He was rejected and ridiculed. He understands it all. When people start talking to me about how bad they have it, I, I can't help but begin to wonder, do they really have it as bad as Jesus? You see, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It sounds almost cruel in a way, and perhaps some may interpret it as being cruel, but I just have never met anybody who suffered as much as he did. I just haven't. I mean, I read the Bible, I see a man like Job, but Job is a man who has to be reprimanded by God because he was in error. Jesus was never in error. Ever. He never did anything wrong. I mean, if you take the Bible literally in, in that context, as I do, um, Jesus is the only one who could ever ask the question, which of you can convict me of sin? He could say that to his own mother. Who here could speak to your mom and say, Mama, convict me of sin? Your mom, wait a minute. She got a hole. How old are you? 30? Man, let, where do you want to start? I mean, we can start from the time you were a baby. You know, you were a strong-willed little brat, and you still, I mean, she could go on and on and on. Let's face it, if you've got brothers and sisters, um, you know, they can, they, can, they can point out quite a number of things that you've done. Of course they can. Why? Because none of us is perfect. It makes sense to me. There's only one person who was perfect, and that's Jesus, and that's why he could stand before mom and say, can you convict me of sin? And his mother would say, well, absolutely not. You've never done anything wrong. You're perfect. He is without sin. So, though he had humanity, yet he didn't give in to the temptation. He understands. He understands. Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5 reads uh, that he was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Despised, rejected, a man of sorrows. Jesus walked the dusty roads of Israel. He was with the people, spoke to them, shared with them, and ultimately was rejected by most of them. He understands. And like I said a moment ago, especially as a young believer, when I'd be by myself and I'd be crying out to the Lord, and I did that on occasion, not every day, but on occasion, and I would cry out to the Lord, and sometimes with strong tears, and I would say to him, God, nobody seems to understand where I'm coming from. I actually did, and I still do find comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ when this Scripture tells me he does understand. Listen, next time you're whining and crying uh, to God, remember that he does understand you. He absolutely, absolutely does. He suffered. He suffered temptations as a man. His human nature was a battleground, yet he never sinned. He couldn't sin. He never sinned. He had no capacity to sin because he is perpetually victorious. So if you want to talk to somebody who knows what sin's all about and what it costs, what it exacts from a person, you talk to him. And that's because he's victorious over it. And because he was victorious over it, he can lead you into victory also. And that's what you do. You go to the one who never sinned. And so what do I do? Well, in verse 16, he says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God's throne of judgment has become a throne of grace, and I can approach that throne with confidence. And that is all because of Jesus Christ. I come to the throne of grace, and as I do so, I obtain mercy. You see, in the Old Testament, the high priest would enter into the uh, holy place yearly, and he would come, so, and you'll see this as we go through Hebrews, he would come with blood, representing the blood of sacrifice. And he was the only one who had the right to enter into the holiest of places. And he did so on a yearly basis on the Day of Atonement, bringing blood, which made it possible for him to enter. But he had to enter in through a veil. He went in through a curtain, a very thick curtain, a very heavy, thick curtain. But at Jesus' death... The curtain was rent. It was torn in the, in the temple. 
And it's interesting to note that when Matthew speaks concerning that in the accounts of the gospel referring to this, you see that the, that the veil was torn, but it was not torn from the bottom up. It was torn from the top down. And as it was ripped and opened up, that was symbolizing the way of entrance into the presence of God through the blood of Christ had now been made possible. That's why I can, with confidence in prayer, approach the throne and say, uh, Father, on the basis of, of the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, I approach you asking for mercy. Uh, Lord, I realized you're the king of the universe, and I don't have any right to access to you unless you grant me that. On occasion, I've had the opportunity to go to the White House. Some of you know that I've had opportunity on a few occasions to go and to have meetings with, uh, with representatives of the president or the president. And so we've gone in, and in order to get into access into the certain room that you'll be meeting with him, you have to go through all kinds of hoops. We had to send in uh, information, all kinds of information about who I am, and, and then the, uh, the, the government checks everything in your background to make sure that, you know, you're not somebody who's a dangerous type and all of that. And finally, when you clear all of that, then you have to go, uh, you go to the area that's going to take you into the White House, and you stand in line, and you go through all of these checkpoints. Ultimately, you go to a final checkpoint, and they're looking to make sure you're on the list, and when you're on the list, and they grant you access. You go through one of those machines that checks you for weapons and everything, and finally, they usher you into an elevator, and from that elevator, you go to the room. From that room, you enter, in, well, in that room, you enter in, and then they have seating, and then you walk in, and you, and you take the seat, and there are, there are uh, agents on one side and agents on the other, and they're constantly just watching the room to make sure that you're not some kind of crazy guy. And they all have those, those um, you know, how they have the microphones in their sleeves like that, and you'll see them talking every once in a while. And uh, Bob Grenier and I were there together, and we look like, we look like, uh, uh, like, like we are, are agents. We're wearing black suits. And, and so I was standing, and I saw some people looking at me like, and saying, you know, and so I looked at Bob, and I said, they think that we're... Uh, we're agents, and he said, yeah, I said, go over there. So Bob walks over there, and I'll go, hey, Bob, they think that I'm talking to somebody in the microphone here. And then and Bob would look at me, and he'd go, yeah, I know, isn't this funny? i go, yeah, you know, and we're playing like that. But anyway, they allow people like us in there. <laughs> but we have to jump through all of these hoops to get in there. And then finally, they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And then a door will swing open, and you're right there next to him. I mean, there's only 100 of us in the room or less. And the door swings open, and President Bush will walk in, you know, get behind the podium just like this, and I'm maybe 20 feet away from him, and he begins to address us. We had to jump through so many hoops to hear him speak. So many hoops. All these checks, all this security, all of these, the FBI agents standing there, you know, Secret Service everywhere, watching every move that we make. And yet, he's saying, we can come boldly to God's throne. Now, think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. I mean, in order to see the president, you have to jump all through these hoops. And he says, no, all you need to do is have the blood of Christ that washes you clean from all of your sin, and you can come and have access to God himself through his blood. And you can come with confidence, and you can ask for mercy, and he'll grant it to you. Why? Because you've been washed clean by Jesus. You have access to him. He's understanding. He knows you. He knows what you've gone through. And therefore, when you petition him and say, God, give me mercy, I need help. Jesus, because he was man, understands the limitations of humanity, understands me, and he says, I forgive you, and he can present me to his Father. He is my mediator who has washed me clean and made me acceptable to God. That's why I don't want to go through religion to find him. That's why the writer is saying, be careful that you re don't return to the Jewish religion. You've got so much in Christ that you want to give up. You can approach God. The veil's been rent. The way is open. Come and speak to him. He's your father. And he's washed you clean by, by the blood of Christ. What else do you need? And the answer, nothing. I don't need anything else. I just need him, and I can come through, through him with confidence, with that sense that I know my dad's listening. He's listening to what I have to say, and that's the confidence we have. We can approach the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need.